Hi, my name is Stacy Murphy. I'm the founder of BK Farmyards. We grow and sell fresh, affordable food for low-income communities in Brooklyn. Um, I started BK Farmyards about three years ago when I didn't have any food in my refrigerator and I couldn't find any in my neighborhood. Um, and I had to go about 20 minutes by bike to find some food. Uh, that was expensive because it's organic. Um, and so myself, like many other people in my community, are looking for access to good food um, that we want to eat and also things that are culturally appropriate. So in my community, there's a lot of uh, um, West Indian communities that really want Kalaloo. They don't know where to get that, so we grow it. Um, so one of the things that we're doing to solve this issue is that we're transforming underutilized land um, in Brooklyn communities, low-income communities, um, and we're training farmers so that they can start their own ventures. Um, so we have about five farms, and we're growing about 30,000 pounds of produce yearly, serving 165 uh, customers per week. Um, and we believe that everyone has a role to play in our food system. Uh, and so I'm really excited to be introducing this panel because we leverage uh, volunteers as well as what we call food citizens uh, to really boost our business. And what I mean by that is that we're creating roles or deepening roles for people to, um, to get engaged and to really be co-producers of our food, foodscape. Um, and so as you can imagine, we have a lot of volunteers on the farm. That's pretty easy to imagine, hands in the dirt. But we also use them for fundraising. Uh, we used to do have them host dinner parties to help us raise money for the farm. So I'm excited to be here and interested to hear questions about how to keep volunteers engaged long term. Um, and also, what kinds of uh, activities are really great for volunteers? So I'll hand it back over to you, Ross. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Um, well, this, this panel was born really out of um, demand rather than supply. I mean, if I run an organization called Village Capital, and we run programs around the world for early stage social ventures, and we, um, we, we see thousands of entrepreneurs every year. And if I had to say, you know, being in the position that we're in, we see consistent themes around social change. And one of them, and probably the most consistent theme we've seen in the last three years, is solutions that leverage people to drive change. So this could be everything from crowdfunding to collaborative consumption to volunteers and platforms to, hey, I've got this, this Indiegogo Kickstarter-like platform that, that, that has this specific application. It's probably the most consistent thing we see. And what, what we realize is that people out there are hungry to engage their friends, their neighbors, their community to, to make change in the world. And that's, that, that's probably the biggest theme I've seen in this sector. Um, so we, uh, typically our programs are location focused, but we partnered um, this year with Points of Light, and Michelle will talk about uh, what Points of Light does, uh, to do a sector focused program around these kinds of civic ventures. And uh, the, most, the, 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 the most important thing to realize about this is that this is not new. Um, ben Retre of Change.org runs probably the most successful social enterprise that is, uh, you know, is incredibly on the radar about being a social enterprise. They're just an enterprise. They, they engage people across the country to do things like change government policy on human rights abuses and end ATM fees for those of you like me who bank with Bank of America. So th I thank you specifically, Ben, for I'm that one. expecting a little bit of money in return. Um, five, five dollars is what they're charging. <laughs> um, Kyle Azevedo leverages collaborative consumption to build better and more sustainable communities through his his enterprise via cycle. And Michelle runs probably the largest volunteers and based organization on Earth. Um, I don't know about Mars, but uh, on Earth we know you're the biggest. Um, but what's, what's consistent is that people are hungry to use platforms, companies, organizations to drive change. And we've got some unbelievable change makers here who make a living off of engaging regular ordinary people who want to make their community better. And that's, that's really where I see the biggest potential in the whole social capital markets going. So what we're going to do in the spirit of civic engagement is uh, these three folks are going to introduce themselves at about five minutes each and what they do and specifically how they think through. And if you can get 
if you can get intellectual, psychological for it, like how you think through engaging people to take responsibility over their own communities. That would be what I'd love, that would be how I'd love for you to introduce yourself. Um, and in, uh, in the meantime, in the spirit of putting people at the center for change, we want the rest of the panel to be determined by you. So how many of you, you all have business cards, right? Or most of you do. Or scraps of paper or something. While they're introducing themselves, I am going to stand to the side out of the lights and collect questions that you'd like to have either, can either be specifically directed at one of these folks or generally around the topic. Um, and the rest of the panel will be determined by what you guys want to talk about because it's, it's late in the day. We're standing in between you and happy hour. And uh, it's going to be more fun if we talk about what you want to hear about. So this is going to be a completely people-driven panel. And we're going to practice what we preach. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to step out. I'm going to step off stage, write down questions, and bring them to me. And we're going to have Ben, Michelle, and Kyle. Thank you so much for your time. I think this is uh, three three of the most impressive people in the world working on social enterprise. And I'm I'm really really lucky to be on a panel with all three of you. So introduce yourself. And talk awesome. about how you think through people driving change. Can I hear myself? Oh, this is awesome. This is an echo. It reminds me of the eighth grade when I was in my first play, first and last play. Um, and it sounded a lot like this, but lower uh, or higher in voice. So uh, my name is Ben Rattray, founder and CEO of change.org. Uh, so we started about five years ago and uh, systemically failed for about three and a half years, which wasn't very fun, uh, subsequent to which we finally found a model that was fairly successful, ripped everything else out, and have been optimizing on that ever since. It's a very simple thing. So anyone, anywhere can start a campaign around any issue they care about. Pretty straightforward. About 20,000 people a month start campaigns. Uh, about 20 million people a month taking action. About 2 million new members a month. And I think we're now winning, or people are winning on the platform uh, about uh, half a dozen times a day. And these are everything for very, very local things. Saving a local park. Uh, it's around stopping foreclosure in a local community to you know, helping women in Saudi Arabia fight for the right to drive, ending corrective rape in South Africa. So really the massive gamut. In fact, my, my favorite campaign over the past uh, two weeks was helping a, uh, a very famous baseball player who uh, in 2005 had his first and only at bat. Uh, he was hit in the head first pitch, knocked out, vertigo, out for a year, tried to get back to the big leagues, wasn't able to do so for a long time. It was a campaign that was started on the site about three months ago. And after massive, overwhelming support, huge in ESPN and other places, he was given his first official at bat in Major League Baseball yesterday. And he struck out in three pitches, actually. Um, <laughs> that's a sad side of the story. You're not supposed to tell that part. Uh, I guess the, the, the important here is there's a wide range, it's an open platform for anyone to start campaigns. And we think that's a hugely important part of a broad swath of people getting involved in social change. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about, I guess, two things broadly to kick off. One is, I think, the opportunity, what's really exciting. And the second is uh, the challenges that people face. Uh, as far as the opportunity, sort of Ross mentioned, uh, there has just been you know, one of the systemic uh, difficulties, barriers to effective social movements is the expense of collective action. It's just very expensive in time and resources. Uh, and by virtue of that, there's fairly limited local rapid response collective action. It's oftentimes through very large national nonprofits. And increasingly in America over the past 40 years, there's been sort of representation by proxy, where people will give money to citizen sort of driven organizations nominally, but not actually participate substantively uh, because organizations are representing them in Congress, right, at a national level almost always. And uh, for us, we've just seen this be sort of largely disengaged. Uh, and people aren't apathetic by nature, but are born to be that over time, when it's time and again demonstrated that they actually have very marginal impact. And what we're trying to do is to demonstrate that there's been no tool ever invented in all of history right, more effective at overcoming collective action costs than the internet in general and social media in particular. Uh, so it's not like a, a small change, not like it's twice as effective or easy, not five times, not 10 times, but hundreds of times easier to mobilize people in rapid response. And, and the consequence of this is not just having more campaigns, but different types of campaigns. So there's campaigns at a national level that create sort of a lot of, I think, skepticism about the effectiveness of online petitions, of online campaigns. 
things like asking you know, President Obama to stop climate change or asking Congress to you know, sort of change the banking system. It's actually quite local. Right? When anyone can start a movement, when anybody can start a campaign, you get these very specific objects of mobilization that are much more winnable, right? much more amenable to victory, and you start going from one victory on foreclosure to 10 to 100 to now thousands of campaigns in the site fighting against very clear unjust foreclosures. And the interesting sort of impact of this is it starts to change the structural incentives of people that make decisions in power. So we hear this on a regular basis where companies uh, that are being lobbied on a regular basis from sort of citizen uh, activists will start to, when they're sitting around a boardroom and making decisions in previous obscurity, now recognize that any decision they make both is going to be transparent and could easily spawn a rapid response lobbying group through Twitter, through Facebook, and then on change.org, uh, and by virtue of that changes the incentive structure they face. So really exciting. So I think this is sort of the opportunity, that's a bit about how we approach it, but how to mobilize people's voices in ways, the like rapidity and sort of regularity that was never before possible um, with sort of the kind of the, the mobilization that goes from small to sort of big. The second thing I just know, I think is really uh, important to recognize is that this stuff is really difficult. Uh, so we failed for three and a half years, and as is often commented in the consumer internet, you have to be both good and lucky, right? And like we're pretty good, but we are damn lucky. And this is really rare. Uh, it's just not often the case. You have a binary existence in consumer internet properties. What you have for any given vertical, you have a massive outlying, huge power law distribution where you know, it was like 5,000 video sites on the web, but video is YouTube. And in auctions is eBay, and books is Amazon, and search is Google, and social change, there's no analogous platform. Um, but it's noteworthy that, that hundreds of millions of dollars have been thrown into these, and uh, all but one are almost always a failure. Uh, and so I just think it's worth noting that this is really difficult, that the fact that many fail isn't an indication of a broken system, right? It's also not necessarily an indication that we're getting things right. Uh, but you tend to have these strong outliers, like what we're seeing right now on Change.org, which is a function certainly of competence, but also of happening at the right object at the right time and doubling down when you see it. Thanks, Ben. Uh, for those of you who just came in, uh, in the spirit of Civic Ventures, the entire panel's questions are going to be generated by you. So if you have a business card or a scrap of paper with a question, wave your hand and I'll collect it. If you haven't, please come up with a question, because we would love to hear from you. Michelle, Great. CEO of Points of Light. Great. Um, so Ben, one of my favorite uh, of, the, of the challenges or movements of late has been, was uh, pointing out that we haven't had a woman moderator for the debates, uh, presidential debates, for 20 years. Oh. So I'm wondering how many folks, do you know how many have have uh, signed that petition? It was about 170,000 people, started by three 16-year-old girls in New Jersey who rocked it, and two weeks afterwards, the first female moderator presidential debate announced after 20 years. Rock stars. Young kids are just killing it on the yeah. site. So, very exciting. I think it, it points to what, what Ben has experienced is this extraordinary capacity for people to create change at a scale and at a pace that is, um, that's truly remarkable. And so I think that, uh, that's what I, I want to talk about. I've, for the last 20 years, seen uh, the power of people to create change. Um, I might just, I'll tell you just a little bit about my own story, which started after college, a group of us got together and said we need to find new ways to engage people in our community in Atlanta. And every, we had, we gathered at the local tavern, Manuel's Tavern, everybody put in $50 into the beer mug and um, we started to send out postcards. This gives you a sense of how, uh, how much things have changed to people to invite them to come out to service projects. And we started out with a half a dozen service projects. And, um, and that effort has grown to what is now uh, about 235,000 projects that are happening every year, over 5 million people that are serving and volunteering. And, um, and along the way, I've met all these extraordinary people, like the 16-year-olds that mobilized uh, through change.org, um, but, but activating um, a lot of them on a local level. So Stuart Evans, who was a computer programmer who uh, realized that, um, that there were people that couldn't leave their homes because they didn't have wheelchair ramps. And he started working with a local disability organization and figured out how do you build a wheelchair ramp and how do you get other people to help you build a wheelchair ramp. 
and Richard Goldsmith, who is a plumbing executive who read an article about a failing school in Atlanta and went to meet with the principal and said, what can I do to help? And he said, we need more adults in the after school time, in the out of school time. And so Richard started coming on Saturdays and the first day that he came, wondering if there would be any kids that would show up, there were 120 kids waiting for the principal to open the door. And Richard and 20 volunteers started, it's just what they called the discovery program, and Richard has been volunteering there pretty much every Saturday for the last 20 years. Uh, and so these are the kinds of experiences that I've seen um, that, uh, that I think are manifestations of a huge hunger for people to, uh, to find meaning, to create, uh, to create meaningful solutions to tough challenges in our communities, and to, um, and to operate in a different scale. I think there's new capacities for people to create change, uh, more so now than ever before when we were sending out our postcards and uh, putting in our $50 at the, in the beer mugs. Um, and so Points of Light is all about how do we inspire, how do we equip, how do we mobilize people to create change, how do we put people at the center of change. Um, one of the newest endeavors and ways that we're thinking about this, which uh, partly brings us here to this conference, is, um, is a partnership with Village Capital, with Ross and, and his team, uh, to create a civic accelerator. And uh, we know, I know that y'all are familiar with the accelerator model, but it's a little bit new to the nonprofit sector. And, uh, and the focus that we have is to create a, a national accelerator that calls upon uh, civic ventures, whether they be for-profit or non-profit. Uh, that, and that means basically that involve uh, people and putting people um, together to create change in that, in that framework. And we, uh, we started, actually, we just launched um, a call to folks to see if there were any, any, any folks out there that would be interested in this program. It's a 12-week program. It'll start in November. It's supported by Starbucks and PwC Foundation. And, uh, and we had 168 applicants uh, for the 10 slots. So really great, innovative, creative ideas for, um, for how uh, everything from uh, seniors can Skype with, uh, with kids and do tutoring and reading that way, seniors that are in elder senior homes, to uh, something called turbo voting, which is, helps people uh, figure out how and where to vote, no matter where they move and how they, uh, how they uh, go geographically. And so, um, you know, I guess my, uh, my reflections are that we have really significant challenges and the only inexhaustible resource that we have is human capital. And, uh, and it's more powerful than it ever has been before and that, uh, and that there's a way of infusing that in all of our ventures in some form or fashion and, and a really exciting conversation to be had around the power of people. And I just want to point out, I have uh, Aisha Khanna and Jay Cranman, who are the sort of startup entrepreneurs who are launching the Civic Accelerator and excited to be in conversation with folks around, around the table. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so one of, uh, you know, putting people at the center of change, uh, Village Capital, the organization I run that's partnering with Michelle and the Civic Accelerator, we are an investment fund. Um, we practice what we preach on, on being a civic venture because all of our investments around the world are actually decided by the entrepreneurs who go through our program. So we say, look, you know, analysts, experts, stock pickers, they're not the people who can, who can determine who the most successful entrepreneurs are. It's, it's, it's entrepreneurs' peers. It's communities of entrepreneurs. They lift up the folks who are um, the most successful. So Kyle Azevedo is one of these folks. Um, he came through our most recent concluded program in Atlanta. Um, he and his team, Via Cycle, they, they do bike sharing, um, and Kyle will tell you more about that. Um, but I, I, we found that ventures that engage communities tend to do really well when put into communities of entrepreneurs. So I think Kyle's story is, is not unique. And the, 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 um, the business model is amazing. What's amazing is, is the potential in America's communities. So Kyle, introduce yourself. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, my name is Kyle Zavito. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Via Cycle, and uh, essentially, what we aim to be is, on the surface, it's a zip car for bicycles. We create a technology platform that lets us set up networks of bikes 
in a neighborhood or on a university campus, really in any community, and we let people find and uh, use them or rent them using only their cell phone. Um, and so some of you are probably familiar with existing bike sharing programs around the world. Uh, it, there are huge initiatives in, in Paris, London, uh, Washington DC, soon to be New York, and they've been very successful. And we essentially are trying to bring that to more places by, uh, and the way we do that is with mobile technology. We make it less expensive and, and require less infrastructure to set up a collaborative consumption platform like a fleet of shared bicycles. Um, so I am definitely the youngin of this panel, and uh, so my, my resume is not nearly as impressive as, as Michelle or Ben's. Uh, I guess by, by my watch, I'm about two years into Ben's three and a half years of failure. And <laughs> um, but we've been, we've been very fortunate and, uh, and hopefully are, are on a great trajectory. I, I think we are. Um, but for us, you know, we are not a civic platform in, in the traditional sense of the word, I don't think. Um, and, and normally when you talk about that term, it, it's often about activism or, or volunteers. Um, but I think the, the interesting thing about our model and what we're trying to do is, is we're really focused on creating business models that help our customers become the agents of change within the community. Um, be, and so in the case of bike sharing, um, you know, it turns out that the sort of car only culture in, in the United States is not because people don't, it, not because people don't care uh, or, or because people don't think that bicycles or other alternative forms of transportation are not a viable option. It's, it's fundamentally an access problem. That people are not conditioned to have a bike around or, or to use a bicycle. And so if you give them access to one, they're very inclined to use it. And I, I think um, some, some surveys that have been done say that over 70% of Americans would ride a bike uh, more often if, if they had one available. You know, because most of the time, the only bike you have is sitting in your basement and it's two sizes too small for you because you last used it when you were 10 years old. Um, so, you know, really what we're, what we're working towards is creating a model where you can, you can provide this sustainable service and, and actually make it a profitable service and, uh, and bring people together through that. So it, we can uh, take Boston as an example. Boston, five years ago, was ranked as the worst city in America for, for bicycling. Um, you know, was, people would talk about it as though it was a death sentence if you were trying to get around by bicycle. Um, and, and they decided to put the hubway system in, which is a, they started with 600 bikes, and they just sort of threw it on the ground, and, and five years later, they're now in, in the top five uh, cities in America to cycle. And, and as a side effect, you know, not only do you have more bicyclists on the road, but you have more people outside. You have more people engaged with local shopping centers. Um, you have more people using public transit. And so you, it just goes to show you that you can cause a lot of cascading changes by, by implementing a, really what, what is a business model. It doesn't have to be um, a large philanthropic project or you know, be throwing a lot of money away. And, and, uh, this summer, we were, we've been out in the Bay Area. We were participating in the Y Combinator Accelerator program. And uh, I had the opportunity to listen to uh, Brian Chesky, the co-founder of Airbnb, speak. And one of the things that really struck me was that they, he, he spoke about the origins of Airbnb. And, and the, the thing that got him most excited was not that they were you know, gobbling up the hotel industry or making money hand over fist. And they're doing both of those things. But what got him most excited was that they were enabling all these new experiences and interactions between people. Um, and simply by, by using these resources that are already there and just provide, sort of connecting the dots with their own technology platform, you know, 
they were creating new friendships and, and allowing people to connect in a way that they never had before. And that's, that to him was really the secret of their, of their product and their success. They don't, they don't tell that to the Silicon Valley investors who are giving them hundreds of millions of dollars because that's not what they want to hear. They want to hear that it's a, a vacation rental platform and part of this big travel market. But that is fundamentally what has driven their success. And, and I think there's so much potential both for us and for uh, other, uh, other ventures, whether they be for-profit or non-profit, um, to utilize existing resources and, and bring people together uh, with elements of their, of their community that are already in place, just finding out how to, how to make them accessible. Great. Um, thank you. Thank you all. Um, so we have some questions from the audience. And if you didn't give me a sheet of paper, it's probably too late. I think we've decided what, what these guys are going to dig into. Um, that's not very civic venture-y. But if you, if you have a burning question, you can leave something here on the stage. Um, but I, I want to dig into some things because you guys have some, some really, uh, really insightful points to dig into. So I'm going to start with Ben. Um, Ben, Sarah would like to know, you know, this is great volunteerism, et cetera, um, but whether it's nonprofit or for-profit, um, the, the social capital markets piece of this is how, how do we pay the bills? Um, so what is change.org's revenue stream? Yep. Hi, Sarah. Uh, so the way we make money is an, an advertising platform for social issues. So there's you know, 20 million people coming onto the site every month, taking action on everything from sort of environmental issues to human rights to women's issues, and based on that, we map people's interests, and then we work with several hundred of the largest nonprofits in the world who are looking for people who care about those issues, and we recommend campaigns uh, like kind of sponsored uh, links on Google, sponsored videos on YouTube. We have sponsored petitions, and so it'll be groups like Oxfam or Amnesty International, Sierra Club, uh, and then we recommend those campaigns to users, and if they take action, they then engage further with that nonprofit. So it's really sort of a marketplace for social issues between people that want to make a difference and organizations that need the support. Ben, I'm going to ask a follow-up question. So when you got the idea for change.org, um, typically the volunteerism or collective action world is a nonprofit or a political action committee structure. Why, why, why a for-profit company? So we started, uh, when I started the organization, really in 2006 uh, as a nonprofit. You know, like, we want to advance change. Naturally, we should be a nonprofit. I came back to the Valley. I'd gone to school at Stanford. So a bunch of my friends were there. And I said, look, this is what we're planning. And everyone I talked about to was like, well, you should do this as a social venture. And I was like, well, why? Um, and the biggest thing for us is, is sort of flexibility. Uh, one thing, you know, in the political landscape, it's actually the case that you're <coughs> legally prohibited from sort of being involved in too much express advocacy uh, if you're a nonprofit. Uh, and it's also the sort of the, the tenor of the valley. We very much see ourselves not as an activist organization using technology, but as an internet platform enabling activism or sort of collective action. And it's really it's a deep identity that we have as an organization. You have a lot in the high tech sector and the startup community, frankly, some amount of skepticism uh, if you're you know, all about uh, sort of social change, but you don't think you have a robust enough business model to sustain a company. Uh, and so we are all about the nonprofit sector, all about building power. Uh, but we think that there's just a hugely exciting landscape right now of sustainable, scalable, you know, flexible businesses in technology for social change, whether they're for profit or nonprofit. Uh, but the company way we found is the most effective way of building a massive sort of uh, sort of staff of outstanding technologists. So Michelle, I'll ask a follow-up question to that. Um, when we decided to do the Civic Accelerator together, we we've, we've decided on half nonprofits and half for profits. Um, you run one of the most recognizable nonprofits in the world. Um, speaking from an enterprise standpoint, um, what what is the role of nonprofits alongside for profits? And we're, we're not talking we're not talking about traditional nonprofits like churches and soup kitchens. From an enterprise standpoint, what's the role of nonprofit social enterprises alongside for profit social enterprises? So I mean, what we so we are a, a traditional nonprofit, mm -hmm. and um, and we partner a lot with businesses, but we uh, and we have earned income streams, but we are reliant uh, by and large still upon philanthropic dollars. So would love to to change that equation a little bit more towards earned income, but I do think that um, that there is there are different enterprises demand different models, and mm -hmm. that you have to be mindful of what is your purpose and what is. Uh, the best structure that's going to facilitate that. So, um, you know, one of the things that we re contemplated when we did the 
Civic Venture was, um, is it appropriate for us as a nonprofit to support for-profit enterprises? And I think one of the evolutions that you're seeing in the nonprofit community is there, there is a way in which nonprofits and for-profits can work side by side. And in fact, we can advance our social mission uh, and, and probably will be best served to advance our social mission by uh, electing to support not only nonprofit ventures, but for-profit ventures, you know, like the ones that we've heard about today um, in the next, whatever that next iteration of those might be. And so I think we're seeing the blurring of lines here, but I, but I, I personally believe that there is still a rationale for both and that there, is, there are not always going to be market revenue-based uh, ways of supporting nonprofit community activity in every circumstance. And that we have to, I mean, we've seen nonprofits over the last 30 years, you know, we have 1.9 million nonprofits in the country. They've doubled over the last 30 years. So we're seeing a growing industry. It's 10% of our employment. So I think we have a vibrant nonprofit sector that can be supplemented and complemented by uh, social enterprise and private sector and by cross sector learning. Um, and, and, you know, so I think there's complementary ways of, uh, of working, to working together. Yeah. Let me, let me ask you a follow up question. So um, assume that. Assume that there's a philanthropist either in the audience or watching us on simulcast or reading us on Twitter, and they say, okay, I really buy into this civic ventures thing. Um, I do want to use philanthropic money, but I want the highest lever, I, I want to hit a very high leverage point for people driving better communities. And um, I would say, well, you should join us in supporting the Civic Accelerator, but you're not allowed, you're not allowed to say that. He says, okay, I get that, or she says, okay, I get that. What's the second best option? What are what are some leverage points for philanthropy that you've seen really effective in, in building better communities? In civic, in civic ventures. In civic ventures specifically. Yeah. So since I'm not allowed to say investing in the civic accelerator. Well, we know that's the best option. Yes, of course. But um, so, you know, I think that uh, there's, there are a lot of catalytic um, entrepreneurial organizations that are uh, supporting um, civic ventures, along with other kinds of ventures, whether it be uh, Ashoka or whether it be Echoing Green. So I think if people want to be in that, um, in that sort of generative, formative, uh, supporting new ideas, that there are plenty of pipelines for that. Um, but I also would point out that I think that there's a huge number of, of nonprofits, at least, that are operating at what I would call subscale. That, that need additional funding to go fully to scale. And there are organizations like New Profit that are helping some of these organizations that have proven models. Um, the, the Social Innovation Fund that the Corporation for National and Community Service is running is uh, attracting and engaging investors in that work. So um, I think there's both startup capacity for uh, philanthropy, but also um, the what we lack in the sector more than anything, I think, is um, is the capital markets to support scale mm -hmm. uh, and to try and to reach the kind of, uh, of scale that Ben's reached um, with change.org and that very few nonprofits can reach in a very short period of time. So I think there's a real opportunity for leverage there for philanthropists to think about that. Excellent. Um, so Kyle, I have a question for you um, from Lindsay. Uh, so how do so, 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 so there's DC bike share and whatever they have in London and Paris, which are like cities have decided, people, you will do this, you will share bikes. Um, yep. Yours is much more people driven. How do, and if you can speak, you can speak out via cycle or just more generally, how do people powered movements, ventures fit in or bump up against more structural top down ventures? So I think that. In, in our case, individually, and, and actually in general as well, any time that you can create a market solution or, or a ground-up solution that empowers people at an individual level, it's much, much easier to implement than something that's top-down. And, you know, we've actually seen this in our own business activities. I mean, we, we started out um, selling our solution in the same way that the, the London program and the DC program and the companies behind those systems sell. And, and we would sell it as a package to these various organizations. And well, you basically have to convince them 
to decree from on high that yes, we will put a bike sharing program in and we'll invest all this money and, and we will make this happen. And then, and then you still have to worry about getting all of these people engaged that, that are gonna use it. So you, you almost give yourself twice the work. You, you have two customers, you know, you, you, have to, you have to sell the program and then you still have to sell to all of the individuals um, and get them to make that change. Whereas, you know, what we're starting to look at as, as we continue to bring our costs down and, and continue to make our system easier to implement um, and, and build a, a platform is that we can bring this to communities on a, on a very granular individual level. We can deliver five of these bikes to an individual apartment complex. And, and uh, in our case, we can even start to finance them ourselves in some cases and, and just get permission to put bikes in um, and, and bring them directly to the consumer. And so in that case, you, you bring it down just to the, to the individual's decision to, to use the program or not. And, if, and you know, that's, that's a much simpler model. And so I think in our own experiences, we found that if you, if you give people access to a, a good product and a, and a good way to create change, in, in our case, by using a bicycle instead of taking a car, um, but you know, for all for, for all of these collaborative consumption platforms, it's it's a different value proposition. But if you make it easy enough for people, they become they not only will use it, but they'll become passionate advocates for your brand. I mean, we have people tell us all the time that you know they they want to help out, they want to spread the word, mm -hmm. and uh, that's mm -hmm. fantastic to see. That's excellent, um, Michelle. A question from Stacy: uh, How do you keep volunteers engaged, especially in non glamorous tasks? Well, I think people continue to serve when they feel like they are uh, creating impact, you know, and or through relationships. And, and uh, so I think the main driver for people to build upon their commitment is a sense of the efficacy of their, of their work. Um, and, and then there are all sorts of other reinforcers. I mean, people volunteer for community and connection and relationships and so forth. So um, I think it's connecting even those things that might seem mundane to the larger cause that is being affected. And, uh, and I would just also add that I think that the nonprofit sector is getting better and better around um, finding really meaningful tasks for people to participate in. That, it's, uh, that it doesn't have to, you don't have to be relegated to mundane tasks. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are always some mundane tasks to be done, but that we're doing a much better do job of tapping people's skills, tapping mm -hmm. people's uh, passions and capacities to create change at a much higher level. There's a, we, we've uh, been a part of an, an housing an initiative called A Billion and Change, which is trying to uh, to get companies to commit to pro bono work, to get their skill-based uh, volunteers engaged rather than just um, painting a mural to actually be consultants in financial or technological or, uh, or whatever it might be. And we've gotten, we just reached the $1.9 billion mark of commitments in, the la in less than a year. And so, um, one point nine billion, one point nine billion dollars worth of commitment. So, you know, I think there's a there's a there's a way in which we're seeing an evolution around um, how work how we're utilizing people in uh, in you know in more and more effective and empowering ways. I want to I want to so one point that's unbelievable. Very, very nice work, by the way. Congratulations. Yes. Um, I just I just want to say I mean I. Thinking about the scale of the civic engagement world in the U.S., um, I went to Points of Light's annual conference in June, and there were 6,000 people there, and it was like an average con annual conference for these guys. Um, and they were regular folks from across America who cared about making their communities better. And we think that SoCap is a zoo with 1,400 people, like 6,000 is the average. And, I w and I'm gonna bet, that every single one of those people at that conference would be interested in the things going on here. And so if we really care about expanding social enterprise, there are entire pockets of America that are social entrepreneurs every day that have never heard of the term social entrepreneurship, have never heard of this conference, et cetera. I met, met hundreds of them at your conference. So I say that the, the, if we say civic ventures, there are a lot more people for whom that resonates every day than people for whom the term social enterprise resonates every day. So the I think there's a lot of cross fertilization. So it would be great to figure out how to how to do that more effectively. I mean and how many I mean how many how many of the 
500,000 people who sign every big petition you do would, would be jazzed to be here this week. Yeah, I was going to make a comment about your comment about sort of addiction through efficacy. We see this on a regular basis. It's predicated on like people, again, are disenchanted largely out of demonstrated incapacity to make a difference. And when you deliver sort of the sort of experience, as we deliver victories, that's like a commitment to people. Uh, it's, you know, they're not born apathetic, they're bred to be that way over time with demonstrated ineffectiveness. And if you change that, you breed the kind of addiction that we want, uh, addiction for good. It's been follow-up question. So that's, that's what you do now, and you, you do it great. Um, thank you again every time I use my ATM card, love it. Um, why did change.org fail in the early years, as you said, um, and what did you learn from it? So I didn't understand the internet, which is a problem if you're running an internet company. Uh, I think that there are two things. One is the assumption that many people wake up every day and say, I want to make a difference, which is not what most people do. Maybe people in this room, but not most people. Uh, and the second is more of a mechanical part of the consumer internet, which is giving people too many options for what to do uh, and not demonstrating that it's effective. So we had literally these communities around issues around you know, advanced gay rights and stop global warming, these very big groupings of cause areas, and you can do everything from skills-based volunteerism to social fundraising to virtual political action committee. It was a disaster. Uh, and people would come, and they wouldn't know what to do, and they'd get confused and whatnot. Um, and so uh, what we did is we ripped everything away. And actually, it's literally, we had probably five to 10 times more features a day we launched with a single engineer, my co-founder, than, than we do today. Uh, and so I think that's sort of like deeply understanding you know, what people want to do, right? And how, how big is your team now? It's about 150. Well, staff around the world, not engineers, I wish. Uh, we are on that path. Uh, but yeah, but giving both people sort of a sense of not just uh, wake up every day and I want to make a difference, but actually compelling content on a regular basis that's viral that makes people want to participate, not just because they want in the abstract to advance change. They see something in their Facebook news feed, they see something in Twitter, it's compelling content they want to take action on, and then making it simple enough for that to be effective. Excellent. Um, so Michelle, uh, the interest among young people today for lives that integrate making a living and making a difference is exploding. What's the most important thing we can do to catalyze this enthusiasm? Hmm. Well, um, I think, you know, per our conversation earlier is to show people the efficacy of their and their capacity to make a difference. You know, we, we've seen in the last 20 years a, an explosion of, of uh, young people who are interested in, in volunteering. It's literally doubled the number of people that are volunteering um, at, at a young age. Um, but at the same time, we've seen some uh, apathy around voting and political engagement. And I think that is because people aren't feeling a sense of their own power to uh, affect change through that process. So I think uh, how do we build, you know, building out the capacity for people to see uh, how they can make a difference through their time, through their talent, through their voice, through, um, you know, through their philanthropy, through their consumer choices. And, um, and then, I, you know, I would also say I do think that part of this is instilling in a, a culture of service, and that goes to everything from service learning mm -hmm. at a young mm -hmm. age and giving mm -hmm. people an opportunity to participate through a lifetime of service and, and literally starting young. We know that, we know that kids that start serving and, uh, and voting and being involved civically with their, when they see their parents vote, et cetera, are twice as likely to go on to be active citizens. And so, um, so, you know, I think it's continuing to give people the pathways for, uh, for creating change and then also um, continuing to build a culture of service that's going to engender that next generation of great citizens. That's great. You know, I, there's a follow-up question here that I promise was generated by, by the crowd. But it's a perfect follow-up question. So you didn't sign your name to this, but it's a great follow-up question. Um, so Ben, what happens when a petition gets a lot of support and does not become an actionable next step? Do people get disillusioned when a popular petition doesn't actually drive change? We ignored and pretended it never happened. Uh, no, so uh, what's notable, no, really, we've done it before. It didn't work very well. Uh, what's notable is that it's almost always the case the kind of campaigns that take off are the kind of campaigns that have a strong what we call theory of change. It's a very actually core concept in citizen mobilization is what is the theory by which the action you take 
will result in the change you seek. Right? So signing a petition to ask Congress to you know, end global poverty uh, doesn't have a very strong theory of change. Asking a local mayor to extend the hours of soup kitchens uh, when they're shutting down at four o'clock before lots of people are able to you know, sort of go from lunch to dinner, that's actually a pretty strong theory of change. It really is a case that it's quite rare that a campaign takes off with no real potential for impact. Now, not all win, um, but it's, it's rarely the case that they don't suffic, at least uh, change oftentimes the incentives of actors. You oftentimes won't win campaigns. Uh, <laughs> I'll actually give you an example. This is, this is a hilarious example, um, but it kind of demonstrates this point where there's a campaign that went viral. Um, I don't know if you guys know this really heinous uh, band called Nickelback, uh, and it's, it's a widely hated band. Uh, and they're like a boy band, uh, wannabe. It's, it's like the worst thing, like a wannabe boy band. Double whammy, and they're from Canada, which, no offense to Canadians, but isn't the most popular in Detroit, Michigan, because they were gonna play uh, for the, uh, the Thanksgiving, ga ga uh, Thanksgiving Day game for the Detroit Lions. And uh, a bunch of fans in Detroit see this, like this is ridiculous, this Canadian band that's like wretched. Start a petition, goes viral, 50,000 people joined to call the NFL to stop Nickelback from playing. So, it's a good example. The campaign tragically did not win. However, I'm talking to one of the guys on our team at the time, and I was like, <laughs> before, I was like, do you think this is gonna win? He's like, I don't think so, but I sure as hell bet you that the NBA is not gonna ask them to play the halftime game for the All-Star game, right? So you have this idea where you actually, by having massively explosive campaigns, it may not win on a regular basis, but it changes incentives for targets and decision makers who recognize more and more that's an issue that people care about and will change their decision-making incentives in the future. I'm sorry if you like Nickelback. No. Well, For you, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Well done to you. Um, so this is a question. Um, may, I have two questions. Can I just say one yeah, thing yeah, yeah. about that? Did you like Nickelback? The, I love them. They're that's my sorry. favorite. Um, the, I think one thing that's, that's interesting and that's, that's hard, that I think we all have to challenge ourselves around is how do we engage people? And it gets to the question of how do we continue to encourage um, young people but how do we engage people over the long term around sustainable change? And so, for instance, not getting defeated on a single victory if Nickelback still plays, but you know, what's the long term change? And if you think about, um, you know, you think about the great social movements, they're built over not just necessarily decades, but over generations in mm -hmm. some instances. Mm -hmm. And so, I think there's an interesting. I mean, in all of the work that we're doing, how do we? help people get a sense of the immediacy of their change to build upon that, but also keep in mind um, the much broader, you know, how are we going to end global poverty over the decades? Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. um, and how do we connect the individual actions to those larger goals? And, you know, Martin Luther King talked about uh, building cathedrals and how people who build cathedrals don't actually ever see the end game. Mm -hmm. They are, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're, they're sons and daughters and so forth may still be working on the cathedrals. Um, uh, over time, but um, I just think that's an important thing for us to, to sort of grapple with. In particular, I mean, and this actually leads into the next question, but, but particularly in the social enterprise world, because the, the promise of social enterprise is really interesting, right? You're like, you can build businesses that are either nonprofits that are sustainable or for profits that make you a bunch of money, you can also do a bunch of good. That's a, that's a really compelling promise. It is very, very hard to build a good business that doesn't care about social value. It is 10 times harder trying to build a good business that does care about social value. So we have a lot of people coming in um, that think this will be easy and get pretty disillusioned very quickly. I don't know if there are any people in this room, but I think it's, it's, um, it's a really important message to say this is, this is very, very hard work, but it's, it's going to create inter, intergenerational value in a way that some, some forms of mainstream business don't. So that's, I think that that's a really, really good message here. Just a pile in there is, you know, we hear this on a regular basis, sort of younger people starting social enterprises. Uh, and actually, if you look at Y Combinator, which is sort of the program that, that Kyle was involved with, which spawned in part Airbnb and Dropbox and Reddit and lots of other awesome sort of consumer internet properties. Paul Graham, who sort of runs that program, talks about the primary determinant of the success of a consumer internet property or entrepreneurship in general is the relentless determination to do whatever necessary to succeed. Like we failed so many times, like we just didn't stop. And it doesn't guarantee you're gonna win, but you're guaranteed to fail if you don't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the problems you have, this is an entrepreneurship in general, but the outlier effect. Right? With all the organizations you see are successful, right? by definition, because that's why you see them. 
you don't see the failures, which are like an order of magnitude greater yeah. in numbers. And that, that sense that, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of conversation in the nonprofit sector about burnout. You never hear that in the for-profit sector. Like, you are not allowed to burn out. And to some extent, it seems harsh and demanding. Like, if you want to build something amazing, you have to crush it every single day. And that relentless, aggressive determination is the primary factor, I think, uh, of success and failure. And we see a lot of, I think, failure in institutions because there's not that aggressiveness. I think that's, that's, um, that's a great point. Um, so we've time for probably two more questions. I'm going to ask both to the whole panel. Um, and uh, I mean, this is this is very hard work. So that's, that's a, it rings rings true with with me. I know, and I'm sure many people in the room are vigorously nodding at what you just said. Um, number one uh, is from Matt. Uh, we'll ask all of you. Um, I'd love I'd love your very brief answer to this. Uh, I know many mid career professionals that are highly interested in becoming more involved with social change, both through volunteerism and through career changes that could be more full time work. Um, we feel lost in knowing where to start. What advice or resources do you have? I think I'm the closest to mid-career here, so I will. Um, th there's, a, there's some, actually, there's a great set of organizations. There's one here called uh, Civic Ventures. It's based in San Francisco that is um, really recreating this whole idea of encore careers and um, how people can uh, sort of get their second or third act lived out in, in through social change, whether that is volunteering, entrepreneurship. They run something called the Purpose Prize, which is all about um, entrepreneurs who are over 50 or 55 um, who are creating amazing transformational uh, ventures. We also know there's actually there's a um, there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there that are actually middle aged um, and that are starting organizations mm -hmm. and some of the most successful ones. And so I think there's um, there's increasingly I think there's some infrastructure around this around this and also some resources. So I would start with uh, with civic ventures, but um, be encouraged because I think there's a lot of great role models. Any any other ideas, Kyle? Or ben? Sure. Yeah. So. Ben talked earlier about how if you're doing any kind of venture, uh, it's, it takes an incredible amount of hard work, and it also takes an, usually an incredible amount of luck if you're going to be very successful. And, and so I think uh, one of the primary aims of all of these accelerator programs that, uh, that have been developing is to reduce the amount of luck required, basically to, get, to give you the essential toolkit that you need to at least maximize your chances of success, even though you'll never be able to approach 100%. Um, so, you know, for, for us, we certainly are, were very reliant on people who knew more than we did when we first started the journey. And, and so if, if people are looking to get started in the space, I would say find uh, either an accelerator program or a local entrepreneur entrepreneurial support network. You know, in, in Atlanta, we have uh, the ATDC, uh, the Advanced Technology Development Center. Um, there are programs like Village Capital that rely on community mentors, hub ventures here in the Bay Area. Um, and they're always looking for people who are knowledgeable, not necessarily about the, just the social aspect, but about running a good business or running a good organization. And, and that can be invaluable for the entrepreneurs coming through the program. So that would be my suggestion. Great. We're taking applications. Looking for a COO, <laughs> so. No, I just, the, the one quick note I'd make here is that there's a lot of, sort of concern from people that are mid-career and for-profit ventures that they have to have lots of experience in the nonprofit sector to be considered, like not at all. Oftentimes, it's depending on the position, more advantageous to come over, which is also sort of perverse, uh, but that is not at all a barrier. Great. All right, we got five minutes. Uh, last question. Uh, we'll start with Kyle and work our way this way. Um, what is, this is from Jenny Yancey. What is most meaningful for you in dedicating your time and talents to your enterprise? In other words, why do you personally do this work and what meaning, what meaning do you get from the work that you do? That's a great question. Um, and I might add one bit, Jenny. I'd say what, I mean, all of you are engaging with lots of people all the time. So if you can answer this through the lens of what's most meaningful about this massive, massive individual engagement aspect of the work, too. Sure. Um, so the things that are most meaningful for me 
Um, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer by training, so uh, I think naturally technology is my tool for enacting change, but, but what we're trying to do with Viacycle is use technology to, to touch people's lives in a very real and, and physical way. And so when I, when I see the actual change that we create and someone riding on, on one of our bikes instead of taking their car out of the parking garage, uh, and when I can talk to people about how we're providing a service that's, that's changed their habits and, and slowly, you know, brick by brick and trip by trip is changing the communities in which we operate, I think that's the most rewarding thing. Um, and, you know, really what we are trying to do is create tools that, that help people leverage their own small actions. Ben, ben talked about, you know, collecting these, these small actions and the fact that, that people don't wake up thinking about what they can do to change the world. But if you can figure out how to harness uh, the times that they do and, and build it into something bigger, that is a really, really cool thing. And, and that's, that's what gets me up in the morning. So what gets you up in the morning? Uh, I, you know, I think I believe that, um, that people are in search of meaning and community and that uh, giving, uh, giving folks the opportunity to be of service is a way of tapping into that. And I find that for myself. And so the experience of being involved in this work um, is you know, hugely fulfilling and gratifying. Um, and obviously, I think all of us are trying to figure out how do we, how do we make a difference in the world and how, uh, how we do that. I think, um, you know, I see manifest all the time how people can create extraordinary change. And that's, you know, hugely, uh, hugely um, inspiring. I went on a cross-country trip this summer and met with folks ac literally across the country. And one of my favorite uh, volunteers was a guy who's a GE executive who started a clinic um, to uh, to serve the needs of homeless individuals and to um, to it was a it's a foot it's a foot care ministry and so for three days a week for 20 years he's been cutting the toenails of homeless individuals um, giving them new shoes new socks and uh, and giving them and bathing their feet. And, you know, I mean, it's, he, he said the best thank you he's ever gotten was, was not a paycheck, but it's the thousand uh, thank yous that he gets every year from those homeless individuals. And, and those are the kinds of interactions that, that are happening every single day that are giving meaning and purpose and creating impact. Thanks a lot. Ben, you want to send us home? Yeah, so uh, I'll illustrate why I do what I do by means of example. And this is an amazing sort of uh, case that happened on the site about a little over a year ago, um, there was a, a woman that was walking down the street in Cape Town, South Africa, and she was grabbed and thrown into a shack and raped and almost killed. And the reason is she's a lesbian woman and the man was trying to turn her straight. It's a thing called corrective rape in South Africa. It happens about 10 times a week alone in Cape Town. It's awful, awful practice. And in response, uh, instead of doing nothing, a good friend of hers whose partner had this happen to her as well, who sees a campaign in Uganda around gay rights, goes to a shantytown internet cafe in Cape Town and starts a petition asking the government to, for the first time, recognize this issue and take action. Right? No semblance of potential hope. Uh, and the next week, she gets 170,000 people from 150 countries to take action. The internet's an amazing place sometimes. And uh, I get this call on my cell phone uh, on a Sunday from the Minister of Justice's Chief of Staff in South Africa saying, you have to stop. I was like, why? I said, we can't email anybody, and I said, what do you mean? He said, well, our email servers are down because all the messages that are being sent in, which is what happens when you sign a petition and make a comment. And I said, well, look, these women want a meeting. Are you going to give them a meeting? He's like, no. I said, well, then we're going to go to the press. We help people with the press. In the next 24 hours, it was covered by uh, the BBC, and Al Jazeera English, and the biggest newspaper in South Africa, the biggest radio station, and the Minister of Justice is brought on to national television and interrogated uh, for lack of response. And he finally agrees to a meeting. Uh, and sort of the way the story goes is uh, they then have a meeting, we help them organize an offline protest. And after about a month of campaigning, uh, the parliament, after entirely ignoring the issue for decades, or decades, passes a national task force to investigate and to stop the incidents of corrective rape in that country. Right? All because seemingly the least powerful person in that country, right? a poor black woman in the middle of a Cape Town shantytown, whose friend had been raped, decided to stand up. And 
And so when I found out this had won, I literally, I'm like not a crier at all, as you can probably estimate. Um, but I wept. I was like, this is an amazing demonstration of people power and sort of we're in the fortunate circumstance of being in the position to empower that around the world every day. Thanks so much. Um, and thanks to the three of you. I mean, there are millions of people in this country and billions of people in the world who have the opportunity to change their city, change their country, no matter what voice there is because of the ventures that you guys are building. So um, it's, a, it's an honor to be on the same stage with you. Thank you very much. Thank you.